can we have the next slide, please? What's this building? Yeah, this is the public school. You went to that school? Yes. To what age? So, till uh, five elementary classes. Right. And the next slide, please. What was this building? This was already the, we call the Sodator, which was the higher classes, which was high school. What happened in that building? This high school was a combination, you had secular studies, limited, but main thing was uh, was the limit Koidish. And this was, I must have been that time maybe 13 years old, or maybe 12 and a half. One day, the Nazis came in, came into the classes, started to beat the kids, the Rebbe, not just beating them, they were laying on the floor with broken hands and open skull. Till everyone was down on the floor, they did not leave. And this was that came class to class to class. Baruch Hashem, I soon came in. I jumped out the window and Baruch Hashem was safe. But the rest of my friends, they all beat terribly up. This was the big Nazi heroes, little children, high school children, to break their bones, to beat them up. This was their culture, this was their pleasure. You started to travel, to flee from one place to another. Can you give us a list of the places in which you resided on your flight path? When the decree came out that they taken all the Jews, they everyone to Poland, go that time labor. But we knew at that time that in Poland there was such a thing as Trebinka and Majdanek. There soldiers came back from the front which were fighting with the Nazis and they gave us a detailed report what's going on in those camps there. The so-called labor camps where the Jews supposed to go to Poland, they were not in labor camps. They were simple extermination camps. We knew precisely what they're doing, how they're doing. And we knew that anybody who goes on those trains if be shipped to Poland, he goes to the extermination camps. We were seven children. And my parents said, if the will of Hashem is that they have to die of Kiddush Hashem, so it be. They willing to give their life Sacrifice their life, Kiddush Hashem. But, especially my mother said, if we all have to die, we're willing to do that. But I would like to have at least a Kaddish. Somebody should pay Kaddish after we are, we are dead. Since I was the oldest. So they're trying to find a way I should be able to escape, that they should have a Kaddish. To escape, there was no way to escape. The country was surrounded, one side Germany, Poland, Austria. Jews were not allowed to travel. The borders were closed, not just closed. They were guarded. Electric wires, to escape was almost impossible. There were certain guys, certain people, they were living at the border. Apparently their business used to be smuggled across the border. So they knew the border very well. And there were certain places there where they dug a hole underneath the fence and were able to cross for a lot of money. 
They took people across. There was one country which there was no persecution that time, it was Hungary. So we're trying to get to Hungary, which was impossible. No, can't travel, there are no passports. So those guys, for a lot of money, they were willing to take people across. If, it would ex if they would be delivering, to be succeeding in escape or not was questionable, was not a proven escape route. But my parents that take a chance, perhaps it will be all right. So it took me, this got me, they took me, they brought one of those guides, and they paid him the amount of money he's supposed to get. And one day, the day they were supposed to pick me up, he came. I was not allowed to take any kind of baggage. And this was the day when I knew this is the last time I'm going to see my father, my mother, my sisters and my brothers. That guy came into the house and my mother dressed me up, three, four pair of underpants, undershirts, a couple of shirts, and not allowed to carry anything. So the only thing which I had on my body. And now it came to say goodbye. I have to leave. To describe this goodbye, I don't want to. That was in fact the last time. And this was, I knew, we all knew that this is the last time we're going to see ever each other. You miss her to this day, don't you? I don't think I want to answer that. Let's have a look at the next slide. This is what you were fleeing, and you did in fact flee. This is a photo in your book, published for the first time, I believe, which demonstrates the sort of barbarity from which you were fleeing, and Hungary was a natural place because the Holocaust had not yet arrived in Hungary. Now, one of the places in which you rested for a while was Puppe. Yeah. And you formed an association with the Puppe Rubs of Kronerburg. He took you into that yeshiva, his yeshiva, in Puppe. And that was an act of Mesiras Nefesh on his part, wasn't it? I said before that we tried to escape to Hungary. And this was a country which had no persecution as Jews. To tell you how I got there, I think I can write the whole book as big as the youngest partisan and it still wouldn't be finished. The way we got to the border, up the border, and so on. Anyway, I did arrive safely into Hungary. Stranger in a strange country, a refugee. I can't speak the language. Soon I open my mouth, it's all right, the way it's a refugee. And there was a law, very strict law, not to harbor any refugees. It was very severely punished. And the Hungarian Jews, they were law law, they were very law observant. Dine de Malchise Dine and they kept it very seriously. So I had no picnic. To tell you how I survived there, it's again, I can write a couple of books. Tell us about the Puparu because he did something extraordinary. I just want to tell you, I was in Hungary, in Budapest, and I had no place to sleep. I walked during the day, it was winter, bitter cold. I said, Sir, I want to sleep at night. 
I went to the cemetery. In the evening there was a shear, nice and warm. People were learning there, I was sitting down with the rest of the people, listening to the shear. Around 10 o'clock, the shear finishes up. Everybody goes home. So I figured, nice warm place, I'll be sleeping tonight on that bench. Wishful thinking. The shamis came, comes over to me, says, young man, be closing up. I said, that's all right, you can close up. No, but you have to leave. He says, don't worry. I says, no, I can't leave you here. So I said, insisted I should leave. So I told him, the beat, have mercy on me. I have nowhere to go. I have nowhere to sleep. You'll be on the streets, walking on the streets. Eh? The first policeman will stop me and I'll be gone. Please let me sleep overnight. She tells me, I, will, I feel so very sorry for you. I would like to let you sleep here. But in case they find out and let you sleep here, I lose my job. I have a wife and five children. I can't afford it. Anyway, what he did is, I tell you what, I bring you up on the, under the roof and I let you spend the night over there. But I'm going to be here 4 o'clock in the morning to get you down because I don't want anybody should find out I let you spend the night up in the roof. I'll just give an example, you know, just to find a, a night to sleep, what I went through. Baruch Hashem, I came to the Pope Yeshiva. The Pope Yeshiva was that time the biggest, only Yeshiva which was functioning. And to get into the yeshiva was not easy because the capacity was 200 people that we were allowed to have. And they had 350 bochrem there, which is against the law. So in order to come to the yeshiva, first of all, you have to be excellent bochrem, you have to go bechinas. And once we accepted that they come to the yeshiva, you had to wait, there was a vacancy. Someone had to leave before they can take a new one in. So it was almost impossible to get in there. I came to Popa. I came to the Pope of Rofor, and Joseph. He's the outside, it's going to be Mitz Hashem this coming Shabbos. The Chisa Yoga and the Lady. I came in and said, I am a refugee from Pressburg. So he said, Wonderful, you're going to stay with me. You'll be with us. We'll take care of you. And Baruch Hashem, I was there five months. He's my Adab in Mivik. Whatever I knew, I learned from him. So he see who gonna lay me. You were a stranger. You were a refugee. You had no papers. If they would have caught me in the yeshiva, I would have danced the entire yeshiva. Three hundred and fifty people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Herzog angestellt. Yes, 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 definitely. There would be there were terrible consequences if they would caught me there. And you learned Torah in his yeshiva five months. How could you learn under those circumstances? How could you concentrate? You had beginners, you had to worry about making the beginners. <laughs> it concentrates the mind. Yeah. Let's have a look at the next slide, please. That's you as a bucher in the yeah. Pupa Yeshiva. Mm -hmm. That's yes. You haven't changed at all. <laughs> Let's have a look at the next slide, please. This is the Heilige Pupa Rus, Chisa Yuganalaini, who was Moisa Nefesh for you, literally, Kipshitoi. Can we have the next slide? Thank you. This is a, a map which shows something of your flight path. One of the places in which you ended up was Nitra. And you developed a Kesha with the Nitra rules, Freund of Brooklyn. Tell us about that. While I was in Hungary, that peace didn't last long. The Germans invaded Hungary. The same fate which we had two years before in Czechoslovakia <coughs> happened in Hungary. They started to round up the Jews in ghettos. 
I got myself papers, again, false papers, as being a Gentile. My father was able to send it to me. The, he hired a peasant woman. They came from Budapest to Papa. He looked me up. She brought me those papers. And I was ready to escape from, from, the, from the ghetto in Pope. It wasn't easy, I had to add pails. I didn't look like a peasant or a goy. So I had to get my, my pace cut off. I had to get a haircut like the goyim do. And I had to get dressed like the goyim. I had no, no money to buy myself clothes. So I had a long coat. I went to the tailor, he cut it down short. And I got some clothes from some goyim. Now it came to cut off the pace. I went to the barber and I said, listen, uh, make my hair cut like the goyim do. I should look like a goyim. He says, oh, you want to escape? It's against the law. You're not allowed to do that. With dine, the malchis dine. It's against the law. And in Gor Hashem, I got the haircut without his help and I escaped Papa and I now in Czechoslovakia in our town the Jewish question was solved they, they killed them all they did not search anymore for Jews and those few Jews which were there they were tolerated it was a handful one of the center was the Nitri Yeshiva so again, I had to come from Hungary again to Czechoslovakia. It was not a joy ride either. I had to again find smugglers to get you across, across the border. Got, got myself one of those smugglers. So we're supposed to meet in a border town. To get to that border town was not easy because they stopped you, they identified you every station and so on. So you had to be very, very, it was a whole idea just to get there. And Borch Hashem, I got to that border town and we're supposed to meet at a certain cross section on the highway, a person with a bicycle, with a head, with a long peasant feather. This is supposed to be our guide is supposed to take us across back to Czechoslovakia. I arrive to that meeting place and I see another person, then another person came and all of a sudden there were a number of people and here at that time there were no cell phones or communications but people they see gathering here, strange people, the first thing they would do is notify the first policemen or police station they can reach. So I said, this is not going to succeed. So I saw alongside the road there was a sewer pipe, storm sewer, concrete pipe. So I climbed in there. From there, from the end of the pipe, I was able to observe that meeting point where that man with the feather supposed to come. Not for long, there were over 30 people gathered in that little intersection out in the fields nowhere. Anyone a mile away could see those people gathering. The first thing is he'll notify the authorities you know, for the Nazis, the police. So I said, this is not going to work. But waiting inside that, inside that sewer pipe, all of a sudden, the man with the bicycle arrives with the feather, and it speaks to them, and they go into the fields disappear into the fields. I had no faith in that whole mission. I followed them, but I kept just enough distance I should not lose them. And when we walked, I made sure I walked next to high corn fields or next to uh, trees, forests, 
in case they have somewhere to escape. And they kept on walking for a couple of hours. All of a sudden, after a couple of hours, out, the Germans, the Nazis were there. They stopped them. I started to run right in the, in the cornfield. And they had two little bags, handbags with me. And I started to run. All of a sudden, they started to shoot. And I hit the whistle. The, the bullets were whistling past my ear. And I kept running with all my strength. Then I threw away one bag. I should be able to run better. Then I threw away the other bag. I should run better. And I kept on running. Then I, it was early, late winter, springtime. I had the winter coat on. I took the winter coat and threw it away as we were run. So I ran in the shirt. And what happened is, all of a sudden I found myself on the floor and hear noises. Apparently I must have fainted. And uh, now I can hear the questioning of those people. And a lot of noises there. Where you come from? This, probably questioning them. And then I will say, march. So they march them away. You can hear those 30 people plus the Nazis who apprehended them. They're marching and marching till all of a sudden there was no more. I couldn't hear them anymore. And now, perfectly quiet, middle of the night. Then I said to myself, all right, you're not caught, but what do you do now? I'm supposed to go across the border. Where is the border? To the right, to the left? I looked up to heaven. Maybe the stars will tell me. Couldn't get no information from there either. So I said to myself, if I stay here in the morning, you're going to see all the, foot, the footprints on the maroon, their fields. The president's going to come to work on the fields. The first thing they're going to call the, the Nazis, the, the, the Gestapo, and the, the. So I was in a dilemma. While I was thinking, laying there, all of a sudden I hear some noise in the forest. I got scared. Most probably Nazis left behind. Some, 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 some Nazis wait till, till I come out from the bushes. So I was perfectly quiet, didn't make any. After a few minutes, I said to myself, maybe that per there is somebody, somebody is there. And maybe it's also somebody who escaped. Maybe two of us will figure out how to get out of this dilemma. So I didn't want to miss that opportunity. But then on the other hand, I said, perhaps the Nazis are hiding here, or waiting for me to come out. So if I make any noise, I'll be caught. So I said, I made a little bit of noise in the grass. Any normal person would say it's a wind or a rabbit went by. He wouldn't even notice it because such a slight noise it was normal to hear. And I made a little noise in the grass. All of a sudden, that person stopped walking. I waited another few minutes, started to walk again. I see again someone is walking. I made again this little noise again. That person stopped. So I figured, this is somebody who is just as afraid as I am. If this would be one of the Gestapo's there, he wouldn't even notice it. Since he stopped and so on, must be also somebody who is. So I can't miss that opportunity. I have to make contact with him. All of a sudden, they started to walk again. At that time, I took a fix of the direction where noise comes from, and I started to run to that direction. And I reached the person, and all of a sudden, the tall man with the big knife right over my neck. And I was ready to launch. Then he looked at me. He saw that I'm not one of the Gestapo, I'm not one of the Nazis, so I dropped the knife. And he tells me, I'm the one who is, I escaped also. Those people are gone, they'll be dead tomorrow. But you come, it's too late to cross the border, which is later early. In a couple, two, two, two three hours, it will be daylight. I'll take you to my house and we'll try it tomorrow. 
So he took me to his peasant house, and then next day we went across the border, and Bur Hashem arrived safely into Niger. In Niger, we had the Niger full of Shulam. This was this called they called the Niger camp and the yeshiva in the surrounding buildings. The Dorofs are they called they called that this was a so-called tolerated area. They call it the Vatican, which was a certain status that the Nazis, there was agreement with them, they will not touch it. And this place was full with refugees from all over, from Galicia, from Poland, from you name it, any country, they were all there hiding. Many Rabon, Hushu Rabon were hiding there. We escaped from Poland and other places. And the Shiva was functioning full, uh, full force. So I stayed in the Shiva in Niger and Baruch uh, Hashem. But then those few Jews who the Nazis tolerated at that time, this came also to an end because the country made a revolution against the Nazis and they organized the partisans and they were fighting the Nazis and were quite successful. So we knew that Germans, there's no match. Those parties that are no match to the big German army, and they're going to be defeated. And they were defeated. Once they were defeated, the partisans, they went, the hardcore partisans went into the, deep into the mountains, and the rest of them, they caught them as prisoners of war. But I'm going we knew. To skip to the partisans in a moment, but I just wanted to ask for the next slide of the Nitro roof, please. That's the Nitro roof at the time that you knew him. And the next slide is of his Adam Reb Michal Be'er Weismandel's point of view. But Mike, Reb Michal Be'er taught you a very, very important lesson. Tell us about that lesson. I would like to first uh, address the question of Nitro roof. We were learning the Shiva in Niger, and uh, I was the end of this month, and I wanted to travel to Pressburg to get myself papers that I'm a goy. So I came to Pressburg, and so I wanted to go to Pressburg. So the Niger asked me, I asked permission to leave. He says, all right, but are you finished with the Groisverhelm? End of this month, they have the big, the big beginners. He said, are you ready? So I said, yes. And do you know the Gemara also, word by word by heart? Looked at that, I don't know. So he says, go back and learn. When you finish knowing it by heart, come back to me. So he didn't let me go. A few days later, I went again to the Rebbe and told him I would like to leave. So he said, go ahead, but get your papers and come back in two days. I came to Pressburg and by coincidence, the person who were making those Goyshe papers in order to be saved, this was a gentleman by the name of Motche Einhorn. And the Motche Einhorn happened to be the Pschleume, his uncle. Pschleume He's Einhorn's the, uncle. Was the, no, no. Pschleume Stern. Our benefactor here. Yeah, oh, this is the yeah. Pschleim. This is the was his uncle. <laughs> so I remember I came to him, told him to wait outside. After half an hour, he comes over, gave me my pictures, he comes over, he gave me my new name, my new religion, and my new son. And these were the papers, and those papers, Baruch Hashem, were saved. Okay. What did Rabbi Cholbeer teach you? Yeah. The Cholbeer. He was, this was the last couple of, I would say, maybe a month or weeks where the few people in Pressburg were still in Pressburg. That time, everybody knew our days are counted. Each one who was there had prepared a bunker or some place to escape and so on, or had papers as a goy or some way, because we knew that, that days are counted, except that time, the Mechur by Weismandl, was the son of the Knight of he was negotiating with the top echelon of the Nazis, Himmler's deputy, 
And he negotiated at that time, they were willing to save the Hungarian Jews for a certain amount of money. And the negotiations went up day by day. And that time I was in Pressburg in the house of the Schleumstern. And the meetings, this was the center of the meeting place of Rabbi Weismandl. And there was, there was sitting the committee, there was some, this is Dr. Silva from Krakow and different people who were giving him guidelines how to proceed with his negotiations. Was very uh, the Hungarian jury depended on this, and of course they would make a deal with the Hungarians. The people in Pressburg were also safe automatically, and they were negotiating, and they supposed to deliver the demands, the money. Well, unfortunately, they made contact with Switzerland, they made contact with America and uh, with the Jewish Congress and with Zionist organizations and it came on deaf ears. They promised first, never came up with the delivery till finally they saw that they can't deliver. They stopped the one day, they just kept him there the by Weiss Mantle and put him straight into the into the camp to send him to Auschwitz. But while we were negotiating, I was listening into one day, listening in what they have to say. All of a sudden, while I'm sitting there, and I have my papers, Roman Catholic, you know, and the whole Weismandl looks at me, and looks at my shirt, and all of a sudden, he gets up, he says, what? I go in a telescope? He went ahead, oh, I my shirt off, I need the telescope now. <laughs> he had tried to be a from Catholic, you know, with a telescope in disguise. So, yeah. He was insisting very much that every person should have in his shoe a hacksaw, a metal saw, to cut open when they already in the in the in the transport to cut open the the latch and jump the train. And not only that, he trained us how to jump. And the running train, which goes a certain speed, there's a way of jumping the video getting killed. So there's a certain method which he taught us how to do that. Let's skip forward to when you joined the partisans. Can we have the next three slides, please? We'll skip that one. This one. This was your partisan commander. Yes. Now, let me ask you a few short questions in order to bring out the key points. The partisans <laughs> were roughnecks. They were hooligans. They were thugs. Is that a fair characterization? No, it's, no not really. <laughs> they were more beasts than men. <laughs> They're more beasts than men, yes. <laughs> and, and you managed to get along with them. In fact, you participated in killing Nazis. Yeah, you had no choice. It was your job. What went through your mind when you were involved in those actions that resulted in Nazis being killed? When you out in the trench or in the forest and you shoot, you have only one thing in mind, you know, so to silence your enemy fire. If he gets killed or not killed there, soon there's no more fire coming back. That's your, that's what I accomplished. There's nothing to think of. But there was a rule when you cut, when you cut the Nazis, the person who caught them, he had the privilege to execute them. And I, brought in two Nazis. Of course, they brought them in, and they kept them for a couple of days to get from them information, questioning them. Once the the 
bullets are made for soldiers. There was Nazis, there are beasts, and there's two honorable who are dead to shoot them. So they didn't shoot them, they had other methods to take care of them. Anyway, it came to, to the execution of those two Nazis. They were tied to the tree. And here I see myself, Obersturmführer, SS captain. So I said, that mighty hero, you know, most, he killed thousands and thousands of innocent people, including my mother, my sisters, and my fathers. And here, all of a sudden, that big hero is begging, let me live. I have wife and children. Let me live. I'm not a Nazi. I'm good. And he's begging there. So I said, you miserable beast, you big hero. That's your heroism now. He's begging like a... Anyway, when it came to the execution, I had my friend with me. And we carried long knives in the boot beside the guns. This was customary. So I told my my companion, I'll give you the cover, I'll give you the honor, you do it. He never thanked me for it. As a partisan, you lived in caves, you lived in the forest, and yet you managed to keep kashras. Yeah, Baruch Hashem, I managed I, When I came to the partisans, the whole company was in a bunker. And when it came attacks and so on, then they came out and were fighting the Nazis. Or there were special missions where they had to go. I was, I volunteered to go to a group which where they called the, the, the patrol. They went out, the scouts. Their job is from morning to make a tour around the forest, around the villages to make sure that we're not getting surprise attacks. So we were scouting the villages every day. It was approximately maybe 15 miles. And this was the most dangerous job because if the Nazis came to attack, we were the first ones who made contact with them. And our job was this, to notify headquarters that we're being attacked. We had certain signals, there was no radio, so we had bullets, which were colored, colored bullets. And with each day we had a different type of signal to notify headquarters. They should know what's going on. By doing being that job that I went to every day a couple of villages, I had in one village a woman where I bought myself a big aluminum pot. Must have been five gallon. And she cooked for me in that pot, one week, potato soup, and the other week, bean soup. Baruch Hashem, this was done with kosher chulm. <laughs> and uh, when I came to the village, I had my bread and so on, and Baruch Hashem was able to have a much better diet than all those guys who had meat and so on, because the meat was most probably four, six weeks old and have me rotten. <laughs> Let's take the next slide, please. These are your partisan yeah. friends. Yes. Let's take the next one, then. Next slide, please. Patrol during the winter season. Yeah, you can see in that patrol the, sea, the snow there. And as we walked every single day, the snow over the knees, over the knees. In the morning, when we walked, I had boots on, so on. First the boots got full of snow, they got wet. Then the socks got wet. After another hour or so, the boots froze, became like a sheet of ice. Matter of fact, in the evening to take the boots off, was a deal of an hour. We had to hold them against the fire, which we made in, the, in our bunker, and it took till the toes off. And then we had the fire all night to dry up for the next day. So this we walked every day from morning to night. In the next slide, please. Same, same, same idea. Yeah. On one occasion, 
the ice surrounding your feet inside your boots got the better of you and you couldn't get up and you couldn't walk further? Well, the first days when I went, when, the, when I went to the patrol, they are walking in the snow, it's not easy to walk in the snow till the knees. It's very tiring. And beside that, I had a machine gun on my shoulder. And each time you make a step, it gives you a bang in your hips. And kept on walking, and all of a sudden, I just, all the koyaches are gone, I can't do it anymore. So I want to stop. I says, I can't, I tell my partners, I'm sorry, I can't do it anymore. So he said, let me hear, let me hear, and I'll walk back. I says, no, he can't leave you here. Because the Germans will come to catch you, or we shoot you right here, or you come with us. He can't separate from us. So he gave me a little bit of uh, a drink, which made out, I didn't think, out of uh, alcohol, out of wood, and I don't know what the sawdust. And he gave me to drink that, and this gave me a shock. And Bor Hashem, I continued. Had you not been able to, what would he have done? They would have shot me, they wouldn't on let the me spot. Down. Yeah. On the spot. One more photo of the partisans. This is an ambush yeah. for Nazi officers along the lines of some that you describe in your book. Let's fast forward to the end of the war. You were reunited with your father. And in the war, you actually saved your father's life, quite literally. Can you give us a brief account of how you did that? We're going back in the time when I was in Hungary, before I came to Papa. I was in Budapest, and I explained to you I had nowhere to sleep. It was my worst possible time during the whole war. My mother escaped also. My father escaped to Hungary. He had papers. He spoke the language. So he was able to function. My mother also escaped. Unfortunately, they got caught on the border. And she was put in with my two brothers and sisters. One was four or five years old, a little girl. The other was my young children. We were put in the hospital on the police guard. And hopefully they'll be able to get her out. And I knew that she's there. So I asked my father, I want to see her. They said, that's very dangerous because if you come to see her, they'll catch you also, they'll arrest you also. You cannot see her. And the next day I asked again, and I knew my mother is in a big, big danger. They're going to send her back. And sending back means back to Majdanek or Treblinka. And uh, I was davening in shul. After everybody left, I was saying till them. And I let myself go. Then you have only one mother, you have two brothers and sisters. So I said to them, about the And most probably, I emotionally I broke down. And I said, why should I help her? And I let myself go, with the assumption that I'm the only one in shul, and there's nobody here. And all of a sudden, one man, all of a sudden a person gets up behind the blender. He was sitting down there, which I didn't notice, and comes out and looks at me and walks out. I was very embarrassed because most probably I did my very emotionally go, which I wouldn't have done in the presence of anyone else. A couple of days later came sickness. So my father said, it's very dangerous to go eat in a restaurant because they made raids. It's a scone, they catch you. But 
it's come sukkahs, at least one meal he wants to eat in the sukkah. So it was Shabbos, was sukkahs, first the sukkahs was Shabbos night. So he said, going to go now prepay in the restaurant, be able to eat in the sukkah tonight. On the way down to the restaurant, it was quite a distance. So I still told my father, I would like to see my mother. Please let me go to the hospital to see her. He stopped and he looked at me. He can't see her anymore. She's taken away. They took her away yesterday. I couldn't have can an emotional outbreak. I could not afford because on the street people see you and be suspicious. And they could you they could catch you. They could arrest you. So I had to choke on my on my tears. And we kept on going to that restaurant. We come into the restaurant. We open the door. There's a hallway. On both sides of the hallways there. Nazi police standing, plain clothes men. And so my father came in, questioned, show me your papers, where are you? Ten people questioning at the same time to confuse him. In the meantime, I, they didn't bother me with a child. So I went into the restaurant and I was hiding under a table, there were long table close to the floor. I was hiding underneath the table where people were dining. From there I was watching what's going to happen. They see the questioning him again back and forth. And all of a sudden they tell him, they send him in the restaurant to a corner where a few other people standing there on the way they watched by the, by the police. So I, I saw there's a big problem. See, let's see what's going to happen. All of a sudden, the restaurant empties out. Now they take those people by the corner, and they are marching him on the street, guards on both sides, and they take him away. I said, the first thing I have to know where they take them in order to do something. Because that time, even he had some possibility to get him freed. It took him two, three days to find out in which jail he sees in, in order to do something. So the first thing is I have to know, where are they? Where, where are they taking them? So I couldn't go after them because it was full of secret police. They would, I would be suspicious. So I was waiting in the corner and watched where they go. When they turned, I went to that corner, was waiting again till they made another turn. Like this, I followed them till they finally they brought them into the Rombach intern, intern camp. So I was hiding behind the house door, a distance away where I can see the door from, the, from, that, from that camp, and hoping he has papers speaks the language, they're going to release him. Waiting there an hour, nothing happens, the door opens up. After an hour, all of a sudden, the door opens up and say, oh, Baruch Hashem, they're letting him out, he's coming out. But instead of being him, it was one of the guards. A few minutes later, the door opens up again, so they're hoping, oh, now they're going to let him out, it's going to be him. Unfortunately, it was another guard. And as the way went on, all of a sudden I saw there were seven guards. They all came out. The door doesn't open anymore. So I said, since they let him out, he's there. There's no point standing here. Let's see what we can do. So I went to my father's friends and I told them, when he's caught, he's there. This and this, in this and this concentration camp is. So I got the good news that this was Friday night, Friday afternoon, Shabbos morning, they empty out the camp, they go straight to Majdanek. Non-stop. 
So I had a couple of hours to save myself from uh, being killed. I ran into this friend. Each one gave me some ideas. What uh, someone tells me, someone told me, go to this. Uh, there's a senator who has tremendous connections. He's a law office. Go to him and see what you can do. So I went to this senator's office, the law office. The most bit funny people sitting there waiting. The he opens the door, and the next person in line comes in, takes him in. So I figured it's Friday afternoon, two, three o'clock. By the time I'm going to be next, it's going to be most probably too late to do anything. So I figured. Soon as I opened the door, I jumped to the door and I told the senator, it's an emergency, I must see you immediately. I can't wait a second. So he took me in front of all the other people. So I told him the story, they caught my father, is caught. He's in this and this camp. And whatever it costs, money is no object. I have to get him out. I didn't have a penny thing in my pocket that time. <laughs> and then he says, young man, don't be alarmed. I have excellent connections. The law is before anyone could be moved out of here, it must be 48 hours. Monday morning, I'll go in there and I'm gonna have a part of the list. I knew already that in the morning, nobody's gonna be there. Anyway, I left with nothing, with empty handed. I came again to my father's friends. Someone tells me there's one person who knows the head warden of that camp, of that. He has real connections. Go and speak to him. Right away, I ran over to that person. And I told him my father is caught. So he tells me, OK, I can do something for you. But I want you to know, in order to bribe, the head warden takes tremendous amount of money. When he gave me the amount, the amount today I would say would be like $50,000. So he says, look here, by 10 o'clock I must have the money. We'll go down together, you're going to see my connection and I'll get him out, but I must have that money with me. So I came, and all of a sudden, Friday afternoon, I come to shoe, and I speak to people, friends. My father is caught. He's in that, in that uh, prison. And I told him I need, I need that money to get him out. And it was a fantastic amount of money. In the meantime, people gathered around, you know, and there was a whole commotion in Shul. All of a sudden, a man comes, that man who, who saw me in Shul when I was davening, he comes over to me and says, you come to me and I'll give you the money. But it is Shabbos today, so we have a problem. So there was, that time was one of the uh, Volovodine, he was a refugee also from Poland. He came here after, after I think he is the, he gives the Shogokas, he is his grandchildren. He says, give me the schus of the mitzvah to count the money. I want to have that mitzvah. So he came after that to that person's house. He opened the safe and he said, he didn't want to touch the money, Shabbos. He says, this peckle, this peckle, and this peckle, this totals the amount. Take it. So I took the money, I stuffed it in my shirt, under my shirt. And it was after davening. So I went over to that person, and they said, listen, I have the money. But before I give the money, how do you know you're going to produce? Maybe you'll take the money and nothing's going to happen. He says, I tell you what, go to the restaurant and get a full meal, halis, soup, flies, and so on. We're going to go together down to the prison and you'll see how I perform. 
Okay, I went, there was, I got special dishes there to, to keep it warm, and we walked down towards the, towards the prison. On the way, I meet a person I knew from my hometown, crying, what happened? My father is there. Go a little further, a few steps wider, someone else is standing there crying. They were afraid to go close to it, but it's side streets, they were standing there. Try to get close, close as possible to the relatives. My mother is there, my brother is there. I met and happened, and I was walking with that man down, and I said, I hope I'll be able to, uh, my father will be better off than those people standing here and crying. So we came to that prison, big door. He knocks at the door, the guard opens, opens a little window, opens the door wide, yes, come in, come in. Came there's a little, the office there where the chief, the, ward, the warden sits, comes in, comes up there, the warden comes out, yes, how are you? I see they have very close contact. So I said, uh, I, I want to have prison account. By the way, there must be 2,000 people were there. All of a sudden, they opened that iron thing with prison, sir, and they shout out. So my father comes over to me, and they said, I gave him the chalice, the food. And I said, I hope I have found the connection to get you out. I gave him the money, and I went home. That night, I was in bed. And I was davening all night. I wasn't sure it's going to work or not, but I was hoping because the should help. I said that when she learned, my mother is gone, my sisters are gone. The only thing I have left is my father. Please. Soon there came a little bit light. Must have been. So I went to the area where the prison was. A day before, Blocks away, you can hear that noise, 2,000 people. Even if it only breathe, if they don't talk, makes a certain rush, certain noise. I come there, quiet, don't hear a mook. There was not, nobody left in that prison except the guards and my father. You literally saved your father's life. <laughs> Through your hands. No. Let's skip to the next uh, couple of slides, and that's Prejbog, the same shul that we saw at the beginning after it had been destroyed. Next slide, please. This is a beautiful photo of you with your father, taken in 1995. Your father at the time was 94 years of age, and he lived another two years until 1997. So that is more than 50 years after the episode which you have described, in which you were instrumental. You were the shliach of the Rabbi Shalom in saving his life. You told us that it's very, very difficult for you to speak about these things. It still causes you pain. That being the case, what made you agree to the invitation to come and discuss your history with us? I think what you're doing is something which is very, very important. People today who didn't live that true we think it was something which never happened. You don't need Holocaust deniers today to tell him nothing happened. You take any yeshiva bocher, and any, any young man is under 30 years old, he says, it was something, a dream, and so on, and don't think, I don't think anyone thinks that ever happened. So if you don't do something about it, this is a mitzvah, zeicher, asher osuchu amodik. You're not allowed to forget. You have to remember who you're dealing with. Esav, Soinele, Yaakov. And 
We live in Borough Park. We have democracy. We have protection of the law. We are equal citizens of everyone else. We have the same thing in Pressburg also. Overnight it's all gone. Don't be so sure that this could happen in America. You have to remember, you're not safe. You're under the Yad Hashem, and you need every minute you need the protection of the British Lord. The level of Mesir Nefesh that we have touched on here and there throughout this discussion is on a level that is way beyond the frame of reference of the average young from Jewish person growing up here in the United States. What messages do you have for them about the adherence to Yiddishkeit in difficult circumstances? I have one message which I want to relay and I think it's very important. Our we have to we have to bait every minute. We have to be to see the Gil Shalemo. And we're davening every day a number of times. And this feeling is not something just being printed in the Siddur. I want you to know you need to daven. This is something which needs a lot of feeling. Kishbaruch should help us all that we should not see any more, any of this kind. Kishbaruch give us, give us this chus that will be solche to see Mashiach to gain the Mehdi of Mehdi Omen. Over the last several decades, you have performed the mitzvah of Bris Miller on several tens of thousands of Jewish children and also adults. I see in this a phenomenal nakuma for what you and so many others went through. And every time you say the Domai Chayi, I can see how what you're saying is with this blood of this Brismila, Chayi, Klav continues to live. And you affirm the Nitzchis of Klav Tell us what goes through your mind every time you perform a bris mila. When you speak about bris mila, I'm speaking now not from the modern orthodox or reform or conservative, I'm speaking about our, our Heimische mention, Heimische blood. Bris mila is very nice, the Sholem Zohar, he serve, uh, he serve beans and beer, wonderful. It comes to, it comes to make them the bris, it's a lechaim, a nice seed, you know, it's a wachnacht, it's wonderful, very nice. To really understand what this meal is, most people have no concept of it. We have Tadiyag Mitzvahs. One of the Tadiyag Mitzvahs is Mitzvah's meal. And there's a simple Mishnah in Mesechtes Nedorim. Not a Braise, it's a Mishnah. Nish Kalebish Maise, Nish Kachasidish Toile, a plain Protestant person, a Mishnah, which says, the Bible says, not only is Shekile, it says, Mitzvah Mile is a korban, a human sacrifice. Is compared with Mitzvah Kakeda Zitzchok. It says the Shabbat is off, which the Mechabbat did do with Lida. He is the one who dared write down the Mesoire. Till his time, there was Mesoire Ishmi Piish. Rebbe to his Talmud, father, his son, was never written. And he was the one who wrote down the Kabori. The al which we have from the Hasidic Shesvodim comes from the Bedovid leader, Bianca Vemt and so on. They all, this is their source. And he says, it's 
the matter says three, four times as mitzvah's mile is a korban. And he says, not just a korban, he says, en korban gudel yoiser mezi. There's no bigger korban than mitzvah's mile. It is a big statement because we have korbonas, all kind of korbonas. We have a korban which is pad vesoid shalyam kipurim. There's one korban which Kapodes Klali Stol depends on that Korban, and this the Pavel Sol Shiram Bekipur. And the Medda says, this Mile stands on a much higher level, including the Pavel Shul So he says, why? What makes it so great? So he brings, he says, by a Korban, the person is a Korban. If everything is done the way it's supposed to be done, the Alba avoid this. The zrik is the last, is the last avoider. And when the coin makes zrik al gabi mizbeach, there's a malach who is appointed with mamine of dam hakorba. And the malach is saro shelistoel, the malach mechoel. When he brings that dam from the korba, if the kisse akovoid, kushboch, he sees it, royal. And with Niyad, with the Malach says to Boyan Shah, Ze Asher Bonecho Makriban Funecho, and this is the Pshat in Posik, Reach Nichoyach Lashem, because Bolchi has from this dam which he sees a Nachas Ruach. He says, By dam Korb, by dam Bris, there's also Malach of Min of dam Bris. But when the Malach brings a dam of Bris with a kiss of Kovet, it's a different scenario. The Malach comes with a dam from the brief in the Kisakovit, because Baruch gets up from Kisakovit, goes over to the Malach, and takes the blood from the Malach, and then begins to be based in Gnisa Shaloi. A feel of the Shas Rizche, the Sashi Datoi. And that's what makes the dam this so special. You have taught us so much in such a short time. Kesha with Sadiqim, Emunas Sadiqim, a home of Yerushamayim, lessons in Hachnosas Orchim, on a completely new level for so many of us. Lessons in Kibbut Av, lessons in Mesiras Nefesh, displayed by yourself as well as some of the personalities whom we discussed, and ultimately, ultimately, you taught us the lesson that what we should do in every aspect of our lives should be dedicated to create a nachas ruach for the Rabbeinu Shalom in the same way that the dam of Bris Miller creates a phenomenal nachas ruach for the Rabbeinu Shalom. Rabbi Romi, dare I ask it, give us all a bracha. No, I for Rachman, it is with Zeuchis Zion, it is with Holmes in the Shalayim, Chur Vat Botochni. That Kushbar should help us, should be able to, all of us here, to replant on the Botrosim, the Bote Moisters, Ali and Shem, the Mede Mene, and Zion, and Kodesh. Mind. Permit me.